What does the future hold for gamekeepers? Jeff Garrett looks back at an old Keeper's Diary DVD and says how his son could have a job in 20 years' time. Just really hope that he can get as much enjoyment out of the job um, as what I've had. So smart it needs a dress code. We visit the stunning woodland setting of the Sussex Catapult Club, where Wayne Martin shows us how to set targets and build a score. And it's here full time for members, not like a, a set up and take it down thing. It's literally a full time catapult ground, dedicated catapult ground. We are giving away a Rio Link solar powered trail cam, which lets you watch your wildlife on your phone, plus a pair of tickets to Gin School. Yes, they teach you how to make gin, together priced at £450. We have news, we have hunting YouTube. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. Essex gamekeeper Jeff Garrett is looking back at the Keeper's Diary series of DVDs, which he worked on and starred in more than 15 years ago. By feeding daily at regular times, the keeper whistles up birds who return to the main feed ride. Now this one um, was the original um, start of Keeper's Diary. This is the one that John Pyle made. Um, he basically took a camera with him for a whole year and filmed the life of a gamekeeper. Considering John being a full-time keeper and had very limited experience with a camera, I thought he made a fantastic job of it. And um, that was probably the beginning of a friendship that has lasted right through to today. It was because of Keeper's Diary the whole season that I got involved with the Keeper's Diaries by making the first Pigeon shooting DVD. This is just a year in the life of a keeper. Simple as that. Building and repairing release pens is one springtime job that's still very much part of Jeff's working life. We coincide with the um, getting the pens ready while we're doing our like uh, our main predator control. So sort of May, you know, April May time. Also, when the cover's down a lot more, you can see what you're doing. So we go out when we're on our predator control um, time of year, um, everything that we've got out set, you know, they're all checked. And then once they're checked, then we can got other things to do. So the pen work then becomes uh, the, the work during the day. Um, and we get that done so we know that job's all done. So when it comes to birds going in the pens, a week before we know they're coming in, we just finalise, trim the rides, get the hoppers in, put the food in, make sure the water, the header tanks are filled up, and um, away we go. The problem is, is that the pen only looks at its best the very next day after you've made it. Because once you've made it, every single tree that you think is going to last forever will either come down or shed a bell or come through in the, in the wind and it will go through your pen. Guaranteed it'll go through your pen. And and this year's been no exception with um we had quite a bit of wind early on, uh sort of February time. Um uh, and sure enough, you know, most of the pens have had some sort of damage. Um one of the pens um it decided to miss the wire but go through like I have a driving gate. So this big ash tree decided um, to go right through between the two telegraph poles that were holding the gate up, smashed the gate to smithereens. So we had to repair the wire either side of the gate and, and then I had to go and make a brand new gate. Um, so, you know, with all the cost of wood, etc. cetera. Um, and then obviously, once we'd, uh, we'd made the gate, we then had to uh, take it up and, and fix it on. You know, so I think most pens um, this year I've had to do some sort of repair work to them um, for that for that reason basically because you know trees and nature always go against the pen and if they're going to come if a tree's going to come down it'll come down through your wire. There are one or two things that we do different um, to what's here is because 
our setup is nowhere near as, as big and as ext extravagant as what John's is because of the numbers that we're doing to what John's doing. So, but the principle's the same. Because of the low keyed setup that we've got, um, really we're still probably back in the dark ages when it comes to rearing birds. We used to have a laying pen and I used to catch my birds up before the end of shoot season and put them in the laying pen and I pick my own eggs up then take them to the game farm. We haven't got the setup of incubators which is what you see on here because we're just not big enough to warrant going into that sort of setup. So, um, so I was catching hen birds, putting them in a pen and taking the eggs over to the game farm and then they would just basically credit the estate with the money and then when we got our pulps off them they would just take the you know the credit off the pulp um so um so it was a good save but if it was a good year everything was all right but if it was a wet year the pens used to get you know messy and um, dirty and messy so I, I didn't quite like doing it like that you know like i say so what we do now is i catch my hen birds up put them in a the shed and then take them to the game farm um, so I, I take the hen birds to the game farm and now what they do is instead of crediting me money off the bill I then get credited so many day olds per hen pheasant so which is it's better for us really um, so we take x amount of birds down they give us x amount of day olds back so this is this is the day olds that we rear on here so we rear these up to poults and then we make up with poults from the same game farm for the rest to top the order up, to top the birds up that we need. Just helps me keep me eyeing, if you like. Just have a few day olds on the rearing field. Um, you know, just keep up with the methods of rearing pheasants, basically. And then, sort of like um, midway through the year, um, we'll then get the rest of the order in poults from the same game farm. So the last 20 years of rearing has, has near enough been the same there's been a few changes but I've been in the job a bit longer and I can remember how um, rearing has really changed where in the olden days the keepers used to walk the hedgerows used to look for partridge nests or if there's nests in vulnerable areas hedgerows or hedge verges they'd find them they'd pick the nest up you know pick the eggs up put them underneath a bantam the bantam would hatch them out then they'd rear the birds like that but then it's like everything else technology modern day comes up um, rearing um, has been gradually over the years has been improved and got more technical got more modern um, where you can rear more birds for similar sort of time you know whereas in the olden days <laughs> you know to take off 30 hen birds or 40 hen birds and, and let them have a run, that used to take you two or three hours. You know, you take them off, you'd put on a stick, you know, on a bit of string on the leg, on a, on a stick, you put a bit of grub, you'd put water there, you'd go down the row, you'd, you'd release them out of the coops, let them do their business, give them 10 minutes, and then you have to go along again and put them all back in again. You know, so it's very labour intense in the olden days, and, and modern days, like everything else, it, it's just, you know, you still do the same job, but it's the way you do it has, has changed. So all John's doing here is, is just having a bit of a social, you know, a little bit like we, we did with the clay shoot. Um, John's putting on just a barbecue, um, hog roast, um, just for all the people that help, help the shoot through the year. Um, you know, because there's, there's a lot of people that help a successful shoot um, and they need to be, you know, catered for. So, because um, with without the helpers, it doesn't matter who you are, without your helpers, beaters all through the year, you know, you won't be out of function. Paul. Oh. Can't hit that seabird. I've, I've set a clay shoot up, a 60 bird clay shoot. Raising funds for the National Gamekeepers Organisation, which I'm, uh, you know, a very big part of. We're on on our place, my place where I work. Right behind us here is the pool shoot. Um, I just shot it. Not too bad, although I didn't hit the seabird. Really, we're just here 
mate raising money, but hopefully giving everyone the enjoyment of coming out, taking part in a, in a nice clothes shoot. The weather's absolutely fantastic uh, and we couldn't have better settings. So really, you know, as part of a keeper, um, raising funds for the NGO is one little job or one little um, part that I do take seriously. And the more we can make, the more money we can help. You know, the shoot does play an important role in the countryside, um, you know, for, you know, getting people involved, for conservation, you know, making sure that there's room for everything in the country to to survive. You know, we do control vermin, as I've said before, we do, you know, there's no getting away from it, but by controlling vermin, other things have a chance to survive. And like here's another thing here, because of game cover, um, and we, we put game cover down here, you know, that block there, that was, wasn't in any scheme, that was just what the farm and the shoot put down. Well, there's tons of food there, you know, and that's gonna keep a lot of birds through the winter time. A lot of wild birds, you know, songbirds, all the way through the winter time. The principle of, of the, the job is still the same. You know, we're, we're rearing um, pheasants, game birds, we're protecting the wild game um, for shoot days. There's, that's it, that's the bottom line of it. But um, legislation that are coming in um, from, from Europe, from the government, uh, these are the things that are changing, that have changed, like um, antibiotics, emptral, you know, drugs that have been banned for, for very good reasons. Um, you know, these are things that make the job not harder, but make you have to work that little bit more. And, you know, rather than cutting corners, you have to do the job properly, um, which is not a bad thing. There's, there's lots of changes nowadays that have come into force that have been put upon us that they are a good thing. One of the biggest things that's changed from when these were all made is that I'm 20 years older, um, you know, and, you know, I've got a few more years left in the job. Hopefully I'll get to the end of it. Um, you know, I thoroughly enjoyed my time as a keeper. I've been very lucky, met some fantastic people, but the job moves on, you know. So, so now, um, you know, I'm fortunate that my son, Justin, um, He's, he's a gamekeeper. He works with us on here. He's the beat keeper on here. He's got his own beat. Um, and, you know, he rears some of the birds as well. He looks after some of the birds later on. Um, and it, it, from, a, from my point of view, it, it's great that I can see my son coming up and following me in my footsteps. And, you know, I, I just really hope that he can get as much enjoyment as the job um, as what I've had and I hope the job carries on to see him through to the end of his career. Thank you, Jeff. Now, from the reminiscences of an old man reaching the end of his career, to David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. The Countryside Alliance is asking supporters to sign a petition to counter extremist attacks by antis. Animal rights campaigners are lobbying Yorkshire Water not to renew the shooting lease on Thornton Moor near Bradford. A review is considering if shooting of grouse and partridge can continue on land near Ogden Water, where the lease ends later this year. Anti-group Wild Moors is campaigning to end grouse shooting there. The Countryside Alliance says the Wild Moors campaign is based on misinformation. The Alliance wants the water company to consider the available science and evidence which supports the renewal of the shooting lease. We're asking those who care about our moorlands to ensure that Yorkshire Water has all the facts about the enormous environmental, economic and social benefits of shooting and its management of uplands by signing our e-lobby and emailing Yorkshire Water. Already over 1,800 of you have made your voice heard and told Yorkshire Water about the important role that shooting plays, not only environmentally, but economically in rural communities. So we're hoping that Yorkshire Water will take a robust stance in the face of lobbying it is currently facing from this small minority. The sole aim of which is to see an end of shooting without having given 
any consideration to the serious consequences that this would have. Thermal imaging is now so good, scientists are using it to identify individual animals. Dr Jamie Dick of Queen's University Belfast, who is pioneering the technique, is researching badgers. He says that the pulsar accolade he uses allows him to identify specific animals, which has led him to discover there are more badgers in some areas than the previous methods of averaging numbers based on sets. From a high seat with the accolade on certain settings out to 30, 40, 50 metres, I can tell which badger is which from the pattern of the heat not the pattern of the coloration. A wild bracken fire has damaged a famous Scottish landmark. The blaze broke out on Colton Hill in Edinburgh, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Edinburgh City Council manages the area and had allowed the gorse to grow to the point it was a fire risk. The bracken control group says if the vegetation isn't managed, there's a higher risk of fire. The biggest threat really from that sort of incident is on the sort of rural urban interface where you've got lots of people, lots of property, lots of activity. Uh, and that is a very high risk. And Bracken has a, a significant role to play in that sort of situation as, as a, an important fuel. Government vets have ruled out a suspected foot and mouth outbreak at a pig farm in Norfolk. DEFRA enforced a 10 kilometre temporary control zone at a property near Thetford Forest as a precaution. A major outbreak of foot and mouth disease in 2001 led to the destruction of 6 million farm animals. The number of deer in England has risen to 2 million. The Westminster Government's Deer Initiative says it's the largest number since the Norman Conquest in 1066. It believes that the deer population exploded during the pandemic and estimates that numbers have doubled since 1999, causing more than £4 million worth of damage to crops each year. There are media reports that ministers are paving the way for farmers to receive grants to shoot more deer to control the numbers and provide meat. A new consultation suggests the public sector should consider putting more venison on their menus. A Highland estate has had its general licences revoked for three years. Nature Scott says it made the decision against Moy Estate near Inverness, based on evidence provided by Police Scotland of wildlife crimes against birds, even though there's been no convictions since 2011. Nature Scott pointed to a poisoned red kite found in 2020 and alleges there are incidents in relation to trapping offences. The estate says it's extremely disappointed by the decision and is considering an appeal. Moy Estate hosts the popular Moy Country Fair in August, a celebration of field sports that makes it a target for antis. Gamekeepers in Persia are being subjected to relentless online abuse after police appeal for witnesses over the death of a golden eagle. The Scottish Gamekeepers Association is criticising the police's handling of the incident. The SGA's Alex Hogg claims insensitive public messaging led to individuals becoming the target of online attacks. Two gamekeepers found the carcass of the bird in a wood near Dunkeld. Tayside Police issued a statement saying it was committed to investigating any criminality relating to the death of such a raptor. This led to public suspicion towards estate staff and their families, including child at school. Tests revealed the bird died of natural causes. Meanwhile, Dorset Police is reviewing its investigation into the death of a sea eagle. Following pressure from Antes, a senior detective is reviewing the case. The bird was one of three found dead after being released on the Isle of Wight. The eagle was found dead in North Dorset in January. Tests revealed its carcass had high levels of rat poison. Police stopped the investigation in March as officers couldn't confirm if there was a deliberate attempt to kill it. The RSPB led a campaign to force the police to review the evidence, including a film item on BBC Countryfile. A new study shows that buildings and power lines are leading to a decline in migratory birds. Research by the University of East Anglia claims there's a fall in the number of birds due to how humans have changed the landscape. Satellite imagery allows researchers to map bird journeys across continents. The biggest dangers are wind turbines, power lines, vehicles and buildings. Great Britain has won three golds and a bronze at the first Swiss target sprint Grand Prix. Held by the International Shooting Sports Federation in Lucerne, Callum Fricker and Emily Sawyer won gold in mixed pairs and both of them went on to win junior men and junior women events, thanks to Andy McGarty for the story. 
Johnny Depp has become a patron of a wildlife rescue charity. The actor, these days more famous for his court appearances, visited the Folly Wildlife Rescue Centre in Kent when he was on tour with musician Jeff Beck. He's seen here holding a badger cub on his visit. And finally, we love deer, but not that much. In January, a red deer cull in Kinloch Levin near Fort William in Scotland was stopped after some villagers argued that the community should learn to coexist with the animals. More than 20 deer now live there after a lone stag took up residence. Now villagers claim that the animals have attacked people and they want them gone. You are now up to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Now, you may have visited a smart golf club. You may have been to a desirable country club for a game of tennis, and there are even playgrounds that are far too good for the likes of most of us. Imagine this, a high-class catapult club. Welcome to the Sussex Catapult Club. Set in four acres of mature woodland, Caddyshack's Wayne Martin designed its latest 30-stand yeah. course. It is the standard for the noble sport of catapulting. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Very happy with that, yeah. To hit that first shot, I did it at all, it's good. But like I was saying, you know, the 30 mil target at 14 metres, to ping it first shot, or hit it, even hit it in six shots is, um, is, is good shooting, you know. Matt set up the club two years ago and is looking to increase membership, which won't be a struggle. Who wouldn't want to spend time here? This is lovely. This is beautiful Sussex woodland and you Serenity. have a catapult range. Yeah, it, it, it's like a little piece of heaven, really. It's a proper club and it's here full time for members. Um, it's not like a a set up and take it down thing. It's literally the full time catapult ground, dedicated catapult ground. Awesome. And you've set the targets here? Yeah, I set the targets here yesterday, especially for you. Oh. <laughs> oh. So yeah, it's just some variations in, in ranges, heights, sizes, things like that, just to go through maybe some techniques, um, show different shots at the same range, but different heights. So yeah, go through a few things, hopefully that'll help people find some accuracy. Oh, oh no! Yeah. <laughs> so what's the name of the club? Sussex Catapult Club. Oh, I mean, you could have thought of something a bit more. Like to just keep Where it nice it? and simple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at Wales. <laughs> so that's pretty much. So where you based? <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. So I've had people ask that actually. This is a labour of love because you've yeah. made a lot of this stuff, haven't you? Made the stands for the spinners just to make it a bit more professional. We did have spinners and targets sort of hanging off the scaffold bars and stuff but i just wanted to make it a lot more professional and then matt's welded all the discs up we've got like threads on the back of all of this so they can be just literally screwed straight into the tree in situ you've probably got a yeah. hundred of them i would think yeah, well, and they've all been done by yourself yeah i learned a lot as well especially in regards to the thickness of targets and stuff i've cocked up <laughs> i bought the first lot of targets i bought i done at 10 mil thick and the smaller the target that it just didn't ring so we got a load made up, smaller, thinner discs. So it's about the resonance, so you can hear it. Is that a satisfying ding? Yeah, exactly sure, that's that. how you do it. If there's not a ding, there's not a point, so exactly. Ding dong. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Wayne has designed Ooh, the targets shot. to replicate those he faces while hunting. Rats, pigeons, squirrels. So we've got like a small squirrel type target at the base of the tree, probably around 17 metres, I would think. 40 mil target. Yeah. Are you drawing on your own sort of hunting shots that you've taken then? Yeah, to a certain extent, yeah. Okay. I mean, you, with a catapult, you can, it's not like a shotgun or a rifle, a catapult, you can shoot something at three metres if you get the chance. You know, it could be a rabbit stuck, stuck up in the bush at three metres away, sits there. You know, you, you've got to be prepared to take that shot as well as a 20 yard shot or 20 metre shot. So it's about variety, variety of heights, ranges, like I say, and replicating, I think, what you would see in, in a hunting scenario. Oh, what a shot. How far away is that, Wayne? That's 20 metres, 21, 22, something like that. Oh, 
not the faint hearted, is it? It's not, no. Targets are completely different to hunting. Completely different. You know, people will watch it and say, well, you missed. I think what, we need to, what people need to look at is we're using catapults here. You know, Ooh, there's no scope, there's no fired. rest. There's no zero <laughs> as such. You know, every time you're re-zeroing on your face. And to miss a target at 80 mil at 23, 25 meters by an inch, it's still damn good. You know, I think most people would be happy to shot, get shot. within that kind of area with a catapult, shot. let alone hit something consistently at that range, you know? I think they need to pick up a catapult maybe, Wayne. I think they do, yeah. I mean, obviously no, no one's saying that, you know, it's bad shooting at all, but I just want to sort of put it out there that these things are accurate, but they're not a rifle. Do you know what I mean? They're not a gun, they're not that accurate. They, you can't consistently hit something at 25 meters, pinpoint, pinpoint, pinpoint. You can only ever hope to be within that rough killing area, you know? Oh! oh. Look at his face. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, we get to witness the incredible accuracy and consistency these boys achieve. Here we've got the rat in the ditch. So we've got a shot here that's probably and this isn't an easy shot, although it's close, it's a small target. It's probably, what, seven metres? Yeah, but it's one thing so you, it? you can miss this so easily. Although you, it should be all day long a given shot, but the pressure of the easier targets really does get to you. Because you know they, they, you should hit them every time. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so you put him out first then. Yeah. yeah. So we're replicating here the rat on the ditch. Yeah, and he's put the pressure right back on me. Our most yeah. recent outing with Wayne was on barn ferals. He wants to explain how you take a shot on a rooftop pigeon or a treetop squirrel. Right, this is the target I'm going to explain to you about with the heights and angles. So I'll set this up just for you, David. Okay. Right, shooting that target there, which is probably four or five metres away, I'll have to shoot that target there exactly the same as that target right up there which is actually about 12 meters away. Because the distance of how gravity works, that target effectively is there. If that makes sense. So at 12 meters normally, you may say you have a tiny bit of holdover. Here, you're not gonna have that because it's not gonna drop because the effect of gravity on it is only over the course of four meters. So where it's 12 meters away, it only is the effect of gravity from here to there. So it's the same shooting that target as it is that target. Okay. <laughs> you believe in that? <laughs> yeah. Let's see if you. Let's see. <laughs> just, just. Oh. Shot. Mate. Shot. Oh. Them. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's like Matt said, I don't know why you said this, because he knows I can't hit these. I know his weakness. Oh, I clipped that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, taking, I'm taking my one yeah. point, I clipped that. Yeah. <laughs> There's even a nod to the spectacular squirrel shot he made out hunting with Matt shot. last year. Yeah. After I'd set it, I really wish I'd actually replicated it exactly, you know? Next time. Next time. One thing that's obvious from taking a tour oh. of the course is that it's great to watch, oh, really from the reactions of the shooters <laughs> to their close calls. <laughs> this, this is a spectator sport really, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. This is your next Wimbledon, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. You, you can see the misses, you can see the anguish in your face, you know, it's like, ooh, ah, uh, a bit like darts. <laughs> yeah, but that's what makes you come back to it, because you just want to improve all the time. Yeah. That's the thing you can, I mean, with, with clays, for example, you don't see the near miss, whereas this, yeah. you do... There's a visual feedback for the, for the person yeah. watching it, isn't yeah, there, you know? Yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. oh, he just missed that. Same yeah, with yeah. the darts, you know, when they just missed the double. So when you've got it's a clay it. shot behind, you go, oh, you're behind that, Wayne. You can ignore this. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> the trouble is, when people say you're behind it, you're generally not. Generally, <laughs> there's generally a lot of people that shout you're behind that. You're generally not, you're generally in front. They're just saying something for the sake of saying something. Or offline. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know, very rarely you can see the shot. Very, very accomplished shooters can tell, obviously from the barrel target relation, unless they see the shot where you are, but most people haven't shot. Properly. Good shot. So with the course done, what's on the clickers? So let's have a look, what we got then? 58. Oh really? Yeah, I've done quite a few blanks. 68. So 10 point difference. Hmm, I'm surprised at that. 
And what did you get yesterday? 69. Ah. <laughs> but you called me out of, what is it? You said you guessed out of 67 yesterday, yeah, didn't you? Yeah, that's what I thought you'd shoot around there. Yeah, no, 69 yesterday, 68 today, so. Yeah. So yeah, happy with that. Can't well well done, boys. I think Thank it's, you. It's really, really smart, really smart. Very proud of yourselves. We love it down here. Yeah. Obviously, this is this is Matt's doing. You know, I've set the targets, but you know, predominantly this is Matt's work. Matt's and the team's work. Well then, well done, Matt. Lovely. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> For more information about the catapult yeah, range that Wayne produces, go to catishack.co.uk. If you're interested in joining the very smart Sussex Catapult Club, message Matt on Instagram at Sussex Catapult. It won't be long before there's a waiting list and, who knows, a dress code. Thanks, Wayne. Next, with game birds so expensive this year, how will shoots survive if they can't source cheaper stock or persuade customers to pay? News correspondent Deborah Hadfield looks at how the shooting community is adapting. These pheasant chicks may not be worth their weight in gold, but at current bullion prices, they are worth their weight in silver. Bird flu in France has caused a shortage of eggs and poults. The lack of birds and high prices have already caused many shoots to close. Estates are diversifying to survive. Hawthorne Sporting at Bowhill in the Scottish Borders is one of many replacing driven days with simulated game shoots. Stuart Riddle and his son Robert run Hawthorne. And being a fifth generation gamekeeper, my son's a gamekeeper here with me, um, it's all we've worked for for the last 25 years and to lose it all, you know, Covid was bad enough, but this is this is just major, major. Um, I think the biggest problem is that I bought the eggs at the beginning, I bought the eggs because I had 14 driven days sold and I bought the eggs to give them some shooting and I've had to sell the eggs because when you sit down and do the sums, you know, you shoot 35% to 40% of what you, if you're, if, if you have a really good season, 35%, then if you think that you're paying more for your bird, so your 60% that you don't shoot is costing you so much money, we can't afford to shoot. Stuart, who's 65, has invested almost £30,000 in setting up simulated clay shooting. I paid for the traps with my pension, which is dwindling very fast. Um, and we're having the first simulated day tomorrow. I'm a little bit disappointed. I was hoping to try and sell one a week to just bring in a little bit of income. What we'd like to do is get into corporate days where we're bringing people from the towns out into the countryside for the day. Um, we can we can do tuition. We have um, instructors fairly close to us that we can get on a day. Uh, and I think that would work really well, but also help the shoot for the next few years to recover from having two or three years of uh, losing money, we would like to see. We would like to think that this will make a big difference to us. Before COVID in 2019, UK shoots imported 20 million pheasants and around 10 million partridges from France. The majority as eggs. The winter outbreak of bird flu is in the Vendée and Loire regions, where many of the UK's game birds are bred. The current restrictions mean the chances of imports this year are slim. The National Gamekeepers Organisation says that after Covid, the current crisis couldn't have come at a worse time for the shooting community. I know that there's shoots that have shut down because of Covid. Um, we have a good year last year, we had a good year, um, a very good year. We think, right, we're over Covid, now we've got bird flu. You know, bird flu is it's becoming a devastating um, disease. We, it, we always have had bird flu, um, and we always used to sort of like think that it came in with the wildfowl. It was here during winter time. It disappeared with the wildfowl. Hot weather used to kill it off. But now it seems to be um, coming back with a vengeance. 
The bird shortage is forcing some shoots to swap to alternative suppliers. I have a big game farm that I get all my game from for the last 20 something, 25 years. And um, they couldn't help really at all. We just had to wait it out. Um, and we had um, the, the hope to get chicks, hope to get chicks, but nothing ever came. So just by chance, a friend told me about some eggs in Poland, which we duly uh, emailed, talked to them, and then we had to pay up front before we had one egg in the country, which was very nerve wracking. So everything was paid up front at probably about four, four to five times the price it should have been. The situation is not as bad in Northern Ireland as Charlie Jacoby discovered at the Irish Game Fair last weekend. Birds, birds and more birds. But if you're Welsh, Scottish or English, you can't have them. These birds from Whitehill Hatchery cost more than four pounds each. Day olds cost over a pound. That's more than last year, but a lot less than the rest of the UK. Shoots on mainland Britain can't import them because when it comes to trade, Northern Ireland is part of the European Union. It's not all roses over here. There are shoots that are swapping bird shooting for simulated shooting in the coming season, such as this standholder, the Cleggan Estate in County Antrim. Back to Deborah in Britain. Despite the issues in France and the increasing number of cases of bird flu in the UK, Basque hopes that the shooting will recover from the current challenges. I think we're, we're faced with a disappointing season for many people. Uh, we need to think of, of the positives, and there are some. So some shoots now will be looking at how they secure their supply chains for the future. Uh, this will build in a, a degree of robustness. One of the things that we, we will probably learn from this, this current situation is enhanced biosecurity, proper procedures in place. The positive is that we've bounced back from many other, you know, really bad yeah. situations. We've had COVID, we've had foot and mouth in the past, and we have bounced back from them, and there's no reason why this will not be any different. You have to dig in. You have to be very, very strong. Um, it does affect you quite badly and um, you just have to think there is, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. This season won't look like any other. However, adapting to the challenges may prove vital to protect the future of shooting. It's not often that the free prize draw in Field Sports Extra matches the news item, but this is one such week. With birds so expensive, we expect bird thefts to rise. One way to stop the bad guys is security cameras, but by the time you get to see the footage, it's usually too late. Step forward, the Rio Link Keen Ranger PT. It's a solar powered trail cam. It has a phone SIM card slot, so you can put a cheap SIM in it and you can watch what's happening to your pulse live on your phone. It's priced at £285.59. There is a link to it in the description below. Plus, we're giving away one of them via our Field Sports Extra show this week. The show that's for members of the Field Sports Nation. You can join them and enter the draw to win it by following the fieldsportschannel.tv slash membership link in the description below. Plus, I was at the Irish Game Fair this weekend where I'm glad to say we signed up lots of new members. Welcome all of you. As a special prize for you, we also have a draw for a pair of tickets to the Belfast Artisan Gin School. An amusing evening where you and a friend will get to design your own gin and then take it home and drink it. These tickets are normally priced at £160. Next, from booze to the wider world of hunting and shooting on YouTube, brought to you by James Marchington, it is Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the top hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. First up, we've got a timely one from Matt's Country on how to keep your shooting affordable. Thanks to Danny from Silverline Solutions for sending that one in. Proofhouse, the channel formerly known as TGS Outdoors, visit Holtz Auctioneers with Simon Reinhold to look at some lovely examples of fine old English guns made by Boston Company. Clark Boys Hunting are out at first light on the opening day of their duck season in New Zealand. Holtan Media in the Netherlands also has an early alarm call. They're out flighting geese over decoys. The group make a good bag and their Springer, Stone, is kept busy retrieving. 
hunting master's official from Pakistan are hunting quail with a catapult, then cooking them up on the barbecue. In the latest episode from Canada in the Rough, Keith Beasley fulfills his longtime goal of flighting sandhill cranes in southern Manitoba. Potterek 81 is hunting black bear in British Columbia. They see a lot of bears and have to go after a wounded one with the dogs. It's hair-raising stuff. And finally, Studio 12 has uploaded the classic Pigeon Shooting with Archie Coates and John Batley, copied from the original VHS tape. It's a nostalgic look at two pigeon shooting legends doing things the traditional way. That's it for this week. We've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the eye symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you'd like us to pop into the weekly top eight, email Charlie the link, charlie at philsportschannel.tv. Well, that's it for this week. If you haven't done so, please whiz over to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv. You can click the like us there on Facebook and on Instagram. You can follow us on Twitter, subscribe to us on YouTube. Best of all, pop your email address into our register page. And we'll contact you about this show, Field Sports Britain, which is at 7pm UK time every Wednesday. And this has been Field Sports Britain. Good hunting, good shooting, good fishing, and goodbye. Goodbye.